before we do uh, lift up our prayers and our voices for the people of Soto and uh, think of those as Frank prayed already in South Africa and around uh, even our friends the Finters who uh, visited here with us and the Woolies and others father we just ask that you bless them and strengthen them this Lord's Day and father that you would as Frank prayed put it on their heart to reach those in the mountains and to reach those in the uh, regions that are not as easy to access and Lord, we do with Andre and Kathleen as well, pray for our country and for your church here and ask God that we would have that same uh, burden, that same heart, that same care that uh, even Kathleen expressed as she prayed, uh, Father, for the lost around us. And help us, Father, to both uh, be examples and lead our families well as we've heard pray, but also, Father, to be a voice, a witness, to share your truth. Uh, so that others, Father, can know the truth and that truth can set them free. Thank you for setting us free. Thank you for your grace towards us. And thank you especially for leaving your spirit so that we would not be as orphans, but that uh, we would be filled with you and filled with your fruit and that we would be kept as a result. We thank you for all these gifts and ask that as we study your word now and as we look to you, that you would grow us further and keep us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, hopefully you're still in Revelation 3. If not, go ahead and turn back there because we're going to spend our time today in Revelation 3. We've been uh, sort of riffing on David's uh, uh, time in Jude and specifically on Jude's statement in Jude 4 that uh, folks would deny our Master and Lord. Folks within the church would deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. And we talked about in studying that that what he had in mind with that were teachers teachers within the church would deny jesus specifically by reducing his glory by making him seem more like them as it were by shortening or reducing the distinction between them and often would do that in order to justify their own licentious behavior and if you recall a couple weeks back we looked at examples in church history the marcionites the adoptionists in the Arians, and we said it was the Arians who were the best of the three, to be sure, but still very dangerously wrong, and uh, really had the hardest beliefs to refute of the three. They did believe in the glorious pre-existence of Christ. He was, he had a pre-existence before he became man, and it was a glorious pre-existence. And he had a virgin birth; he was born of a virgin. But they say, and they said, that Jesus was God's first act of creation. When God first decided to do anything, he decided to create Jesus and then through Jesus create the rest of the world. So they did deny to Jesus eternal glorious pre-existence. And they would say he was a God for sure, like others are gods, like Satan is the God of this world. Jesus was a God to be sure, but not like the Father, not equal with the Father, not of the same essence as the Father. And we said that's dangerously close. Uh, it's not quite fully there uh, and dangerous to deny, as we talked about, Jesus Christ. I mean, to deny Christ, you you, you deny the Father. You bring destruction on yourselves. Jude uh, was very similar to Second Peter. You recall Second Peter 2, 1 said that these false teachers were identifying destructive heresies, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. And there were four verses that Arians then and then Jehovah's Witnesses and Unitarians and others now point to to defend this idea that Jesus was first created and then created uh, the rest of the world. Now he you know again they would say that he is preeminent and glorious but not of the same essence as, as the Father. And we're looking at each of those four verses as you know week to week. And last week we looked at Colossians 1 and it sounds a lot like Jesus was the first created being and therefore is preeminent. And we said that Christians historically said, no, that Christ is over creation. Not that he is the firstborn, not that he's the first creation, he's over creation. But we said last week, that doesn't work grammatically. That firstborn with the genitive case, the word of, always means he's a part of that group. So Christ was a part of creation. But we said the Arians were incorrect in asserting that Jesus became a part of creation through being created, it sounds like, man, what are you thinking? That sounds how you become a part of creation, right? No, well, Jesus was unique. He became a part of creation not through being created, but through incarnation, incarnation right? And that's what Colossians 1.15 was about. And we said that was the easiest one. And they're going to get harder as we go along. And today we're going to cover Revelation 3.14, which calls John, which John calls Jesus the beginning of the creation of God. And 
Next week, or excuse me, on the 10th of July, we'll cover Proverbs 8, 22, which in the New Revised Standard Version says, the Lord created me, speaking of wisdom, but wisdom is often identified as Jesus. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work. Or John 20, where Jesus looks at Mary and says, I'm going back to my God and your God. Those are the four verses that we'll cover, the three uh, that we have remaining, and Revelation 3.14 is the one that we'll look at today. Now, before we jump in, uh, I want to remind us one last time of the warning that I've been giving us about there being dangers, that even Jude called out these two warnings. One was very base and carnal, because it you know attacked our lusts and our desires, even our proper desires. And we talked about there are two defenses to that, right? There was... Uh, the proper use of those desires, things like marriage and, a, and a appropriate eating and food, not gluttonous, right? I mean, there's that's one way to overcome uh, the the desires that might, or excuse me, the uh, the lust that might want to battle and wage war against us is the proper use of that. It's through marriage and the God give uh, God ordained gift of, of sex and, and of food and enjoyment of that without uh, becoming gluttonous. And then the second was just a reminder that when uh, you see a pleasure outside of those bounds, the ones I just described, that you always remember it's a bait. There's always a lure on the end of it. It's always bitter in the end, as good as it seems in the beginning. But the other warning, the other thing Jude warned us against is not so base or carnal. It's erudite. Remember, it was done through so-called knowledge, through dreams. And the solution in this case was to look at what is written. And you'll remember we talked about, we flipped back to Jeremiah. You don't need to flip there, but Jeremiah talked about those in his day. This is not a new thing. It wasn't a new thing to Jude. It's not a new thing to us. Jeremiah in his day talked about folks who would dream. He said, I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy a lie in my name, saying, I had a, a dream. I had a dream. How long is there anything in the hearts of the prophets who prophesy a lie, even these prophets of the deception of their own heart, who intend to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which they recount to one another, just as their fathers forgot my name because of Baal? The prophet who has a dream may recount his dream, but let him who has my word speak my word in truth. What does straw, dreams, have in common with grain, declares Yahweh. Is not my word like fire, declares Yahweh, and like a hammer which shatters a rock. So there's the speculation, the empty speculation, the dreams, the so-called knowledge of false teachers. And then there's the rock-solid foundation of God's word, and they're two different things. And so as we think about how we avoid the false teaching that could be dangerous to our soul and denying Jesus, it's by going to the word. But you will recall, and this is my last part of the warning, you recall in 2 Peter that as Peter looked and spoke about God's word and those who were twisting it, he said, they speak of things in which, Paul's letter specifically, some things are hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. So even as we look to the word, it's not easy. You can twist the scriptures themselves. And that's what we argued that the Arians, Jehovah's Witnesses and others are doing about Colossians 1. And what I'm going to argue that they're doing about Revelation 3 today as well. But it's not easy. We've got to get into the grammar and we've got to get into the hermeneutics. That's a good plug for Frank, who will be starting that really soon. And there's a lot at stake. So as hard as it is, we need to dive in and do it together. So with that warning, I want to jump into Revelation 3, which we read a moment ago. And you can hear in that the sort of, you know, debatable phrase, the thing that makes us wonder. And that is that Jesus is the beginning of the creation of God, the beginning of the creation of God. And there's three common ways to explain it. And I want to work through each of those before we uh, figure out what is the right way to understand it. So three common explanations of what it means for Jesus to be the beginning of the creation of God. There is the, the Aryan point of view, and we'll call it the start of the creation of God. When we say, when John says, Arian say, when John says Jesus is the beginning of the creation of God, it means he's the start. It's what we've said before. He's the first one, the one who started God's creation. He was the first thing created. Of all the created things, he was the first. He was the start. So they see Jesus, again, as part of creation. And, and many English translations read this way. 
They say Jesus is the beginning of the creation of God, the one I just read, uh, this uh, LSB that we read from, the beginning of the creation of God. They don't necessarily mean that. The, the writers of the Legacy Standard Bible don't think by that that Jesus is the start. But this view I'm describing here, they do see that. And the New World Translation, which is the Jehovah's Witness Translation, makes that explicit by saying, not translating the genitive as of, but as by. He's the beginning of the creation by God. Other English translations are not attempting to do that. But again, this view that I'm describing here <clears throat> is the, the Aryan one. And I want to read, I read from this little book uh, to you uh, last time we were together. This is an official publication of the Watchtower Tract and Bible Supply Society. It's called Reasoning from the Scriptures. And they speak about Revelation 3 in this way. Let's see if I have that up there. They say... The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Some take the view that what is meant is that the Son was the beginner of God's creation, the one who started it all, the one who created everything. That'll be our second view we look at in just a second. But, the Jehovah's Witness publication says, Little and Scott's dictionary, it's called a lexicon, but it just means a dictionary. Little and Scott's dictionary lists beginning as its first meaning of the Greek word RK. RK is the Greek word that is translated here. And they list in this dictionary the first meaning as beginning. The logical conclusion is, therefore, that the one being quoted at Revelation 3.14 is a creation. The first of God's creation that he had a beginning. Now, again, there, there's some really good reasons for their argument. This is really poorly written. I mean, if you just listen to that in here, remember last week I said they had some really good arguments even though they wrote it wrong and made some mistakes. I mean, just because the first entry in a dictionary is beginning doesn't mean that's the right one, right? That's not the logical conclusion that you always pick the first one. Maybe that's the most common, but it doesn't make it always the right one. So it's really poor argumentation, but they, it is, as we'll see in just a moment, there's some good you know, points to this that are that need to be made or that need to be refuted. Nevertheless, this view, we'll call the Arian view, it's that Jesus was the first thing created. He was the beginning of God's creation in that sense. Now, the second view is, we'll call it the second most popular, the second most common Christian interpretation. And that's the one that the book just referenced, that Jesus is the originator, the source, the one who began Christ's creation. He did it all. He was the one... Instead of a, a passive sense like Jesus was created, Jesus is the one creating. He's the beginner, beginner of it. He's the source of God's creation. This view sees Jesus as bringing forth the creation, not being a part of it. And there's a few translations that, that translate it this way. One is the Holman Christian Standard Bible, which is a, it's a good translation. And they translate him, excuse me, this as the originator of God's creation. Let me read from a guy named Simon Kistemaker who also holds this view. He says, The Lord calls himself the origin, Greek, arche, of God's creation. We should not interpret the word origin passively, as if Jesus were created, but actively, because Jesus is the one who calls God's creation into being. This purpose of this description is to show that Jesus Christ made all things and thus possesses and controls them. So that is the second uh, possible interpretation in a, in a Christian one that you'll see folks hold. And then the most popular Christian uh, interpretation is that Jesus is the ruler. They say, hey, we should, we should translate the Greek word arche as ruler, not beginning. And we'll get into that in just a second. So this view sees Jesus as over all creation. Sounds a little bit like uh, our conversation around firstborn, right? Uh, where we said some people say, no, that just means he's over all creation. So very similar words, arche, which means beginning or ruler, firstborn, which means either first or preeminent. So it's a very similar conversation we're having uh, today. Uh, the NIV translates it this way, and John Walbert uh, is an example who says, as the ruler of God's creation, Christ existed before that creation and is sovereign over it. So those are our options that we have in front of us. And again, you know, it's, how do you pick between those? This is sort of an intellectual exercise, but it's a significant exercise, again, as I mentioned. So all three of these words hinge on how we should translate that Greek word, arche. Do we translate it as beginner, beginning, or ruler? Or if I keep the order up here, do we translate it as beginning, beginner, 
or ruler. It's a very common word, arche is. Firstborn was not very common last week, not a hugely common word, especially in the New Testament. Arche is used 300 times in the New Testament, Old Testament, or the Greek translation of Old Testament, and the Apocrypha, 300 times, so we can get a good feel for what the word means. But before we get into the Greek word, Think about English. Think about words that start, you know, because English derives a lot of its words from Greek and Latin, right? So arc, right? Think about words <laughs> that uh, uh, that use that word arc. And Andre's already come up with one, right? Archaeology, the study of, of things before us, the beginning things, right? We've got to dig down to, to find them. Our archives, right? What are the archives? They're the, the records of the things that started our company or our organization or an archetype. I know we don't use that word a lot, but archetype is like the model that we start with and everything comes after it. So we can see that word arc in the English language as meaning the beginning, the start of something, right? But you can also see that word arc in our English language as meaning ruler. Can you think of any examples of that? Archangel. Archangel, the highest angel, right? How about an archbishop, right? Or an arch enemy or arch nemesis, right? Those are all uses where it's like, hey, that's the highest of all my enemies, that's the worst one, you know? What about uh, like arcade? Does that have anything? Not necessarily, okay. so it sounds the same, but it's not okay. It's not the same. That's So we sometimes have ones, and we'll talk about that in just a second, of words that sound similar, but that wouldn't be an example in this case. I couldn't think of any though, uh, <coughs> GJ, to your, I couldn't think of any that meant like originator or starter. Right? Maybe you can come up to me afterwards and tell me, but I could think of ones that in English language that were related to the beginning, like archives, archaeology, or things that relate to ruling or being the preeminent archbishop, etc. I couldn't think of any that relate to someone being a starter, that middle, uh, middle, uh, middle option. But we'll, we'll go on. Let's look at the Greek now. Um, so there are plenty of examples of it meaning the Greek word arche, meaning beginning. And again, if I give you an Old Testament example, that just means it was the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It was done years after the Hebrew scriptures were first written. Genesis 1-1 has this word in it. In the, that's, that's Greek, arche. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Or Jesus said, all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. When he's talking about all the things that would come in the tribulation. Or 1 John 2, I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who has been from the arche, from the beginning. The word clearly, many times, means the beginning, the start. There's also a lot of examples of the same word meaning ruler. Here's some examples. Hosea 2.2 2, or 1.11 in English. 2.2 2 is the Hebrew number and sometimes it's off a little. And they will appoint for themselves one leader, arcane. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, Romans 8.38, same word. And finally, one example, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, Titus 3.1. That's all the same word, arcane. Sometimes clearly beginning, in the beginning, God created them as earth. Sometimes clearly ruler, remind them to be subject to beginnings, no, Remind them to be subject to rulers, right? I can't find a single biblical instance where RK means source or starter or originator or beginner, this middle view. Now, some really good people, some people that I look up to very highly say it is possible. The Net Bible, which I really like as a translation, it's different. They say, from a linguistic standpoint, all three meanings for RK are possible. I just couldn't find any. Uh, John Piper holds this view. Dr. Thomas, a beloved professor of all three of us, uh, holds this view. But despite these statements, I couldn't find, and they, none of them list a single biblical example outside of Revelation 3 of it meaning that. The Thayer's Greek lexicon, a dictionary, does list two non-biblical places where it means that. I couldn't lay my eyes on them. I didn't have access to those sources. But regardless, I did check all 54 instances of the New Testament, and none appear to carry the sense of source or originator. So I'd at least say at the start, to me, that's the least likely of the three, just based on that. Again, really respected people, people that I respect highly hold it, so I don't want to dismiss it too easily. But it's at least, to me, starting out uh, maybe behind. So what can we do next? How can we keep moving and try to make progress on this question? So we'll do exactly what we did last week, right? We'll note that 
beginning is followed by that two letter word of, right? Which indicates, not always, but indicates in this case and in Colossians 1, the genitive so-called case. So what we could do is look at RK followed by that to see if we can learn something. And so we did that. And the 291 usages of that word, archae, throughout the Old Testament, New Testament, and Apocrypha go down to 41 when you say, how many times is it followed by of, or the genitive case? And just 40 if you take out Revelation 3 for just a second, because we don't know what it means there. We're trying to figure it out. And of those 40 uses, 27 of them mean beginning, and 13 of them mean ruler, or chief, or head. So maybe that's a little helpful. I mean, we can say a couple of things on that. One, maybe we could say the left explanation, the beginner, uh, the, the start of creation, is maybe statistically speaking twice as likely as the, as the third one, right? Not that we use statistics in interpretation, but um, maybe we could say it's twice as likely. And again, the middle explanation seems quite unlikely. Of the 40, there's not a single one uh, that, that have that meaning. But here's where the key observation comes when we again look at RK followed by of, and it's the same observation. You're gonna feel like this is a rerun. It's gonna diverge in the end and it'll have a different ending, but it's gonna feel like a rerun from last week. The key observation when we look at the word RK followed by of is not that it's beginner, twi beginning twice as much as it is ruler. The key observation is whether it's beginning or ruler, it is always partitive, always. In other words, whether Jesus is the beginning of God's creation or the ruler of God's creation, either way, RK followed by the genitive everywhere else indicates that the beginning or the ruler is a part of whatever group it's of, always. So some examples to clarify that. Exodus 12, 2, after the Passover and, and um God is saying, this month that I bring you out, Abib, it is the beginning of months for you, right? They're going to start their year on that because it's such a significant year. It's such a significant month for them. This is the beginning of months for you. Well, it's one of the months though, right? It's the beginning one, but it's one of the months. Or Mark 13, 8, again, talking about the birth pangs. Wars, earthquakes, and famines are the beginning of birth pangs. They're going to start the birth pangs, but they are birth pangs, Right? But even ruler, Job 40, 19, behemoth, is the chief of the creation of the Lord. Right? He says, I mean, it's an amazing creature, behemoth, right? And it's the chief, it says in Job 40, 19. But is it a part of the creation of the Lord? Yes. Absolutely. Exodus 6, the Levites that are listed from six, verses 16 to 25, the Levites listed are the heads, same word, R-K, are the heads of the family of the Levites. They're the heads. They're the rulers of them. They're the the preeminent ones, but are they part of the family of the Levites? They are. So again, maybe we got a little bit of statistics out of this study that helps us uh, understand whether it's beginning or ruler, but the main thing I think that came out of this is we're once again in a corner like we were last week, because whether Jesus is beginning, as the Arian view might say, or ruler, as folks might say, we are in a corner in that Jesus is a part of creation either way, at least grammatically speaking. So now what? Okay, as always, we look for clues. Like, hey, I don't think that's right, right? We talked last week, John 1, 1, sure doesn't seem like Jesus. I mean, everything that has been made was made by him, and apart from him, nothing was made that has been made. Like, okay, how do we, those don't go together, so we need to dig in further. We need to look for clues. Well, fortunately, another plug for Frank, he taught through Revelation back in the driveway days. For those of you who weren't in the driveway days, I would recommend watching some of those. They're a very good study on Revelation. Frank spent a lot of time studying Revelation. And we learned during the driveway days, right, that there were seven letters to seven churches. And this text, Revelation 3.14, is a part of the seventh. It's part of the last letter, the one to Laodicea. And that letter is very similar, or that message to Laodicea is very similar to the other seven. They share some structure. They share some format. They share content. Every one of the seven ends with a promise to the overcomers. And a phrase, remember the phrase that's at the end of everyone? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Every one ends with a promise, different promise, but ends with a promise to the overcomers and ends with that phrase. And every one begins with a description of the risen Christ who is speaking to the church. And there are other things that Frank 
pointed out in that study that you know show how they're similar. But the key thing for us here is that everyone begins with a description of the risen Christ, and every one of those descriptions harkens back to Revelation chapter 1, where John starts his vision, and he sees the glorious Christ, and he sees him, right, eyes uh, like a flame of fire, and burnished bronze feet, and a sword coming out of his mouth. He sees him walking around the lampstands, and then every time he talks to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3, he takes a part of that vision, and he reminds them of Jesus. So, I won't talk through this slide, but this is something you would see in what Frank has uh, walked us through, but uh, this is an example where you look at every one of the messages to the churches, they start with a description of Christ, and it harkens back to Revelation 1. Those are the first six messages and how they harken back. So we should expect, right, when John writes the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, that he's getting that from where? From the vision, from the vision in Revelation 1, one right? Of course, right? Because every other one is that way. And sure enough, it does. This connection, this description of Christ goes back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, which describes Jesus Christ as the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now, all the connections between Revelation 3.14 and Revelation 1.5 may not be obvious. The easiest is, is the repetition of the faithful witness, right? That's the clearest connection. But in Revelation 1.5, what's another word that might be connected that we just talked about? Ruler, right? Ruler. That's not the same word, arche. It is the word archon. All right. I've always, when I've taught this before, called that a cognate. I found that that's not the right term. A cognate apparently is when there's a similar word across two languages, like English brother and German bruder. That's apparently what a cognate really is. I think this is called a doublet. So I learned something when I was studying this. It's a doublet. It's like the English word cave and the English word cavern. Two different words, but really similar and you know have come probably from the same you know, history or origin. So in Greek, we have arche, which means beginning or ruler, and we have archon, which means ruler. So maybe this argues for the translation ruler in Revelation 3, right? I mean, perhaps if, if John is pulling from Revelation 1 to write Revelation 3. But even so, even if that's the case, remember that based on normal usage, ruler would still be a part of of the creation of God. So we have more work to do. There's another connection between Revelation 3 and Revelation 1 that isn't easy to see. It's not easy to see on the surface, but it's the most important connection. And somebody said it, and that's firstborn of the dead. Now you say, I don't, he was the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I don't see any connection to firstborn of the dead. Well, there is one, and it's hard to see, and it's the most important one. And so we have to get to it in a bit of a circuitous route, but we're going to go there, and it's important. Firstborn of the dead is a phrase that's used one other place in the New Testament exactly the same. Does anybody happen to know where that's at? It's in Colossians 1, right? And that ought to ring a bell. Hey, we were in Colossians 1 last week. And maybe you're like, well, what does that matter? It's a different book from a different author. Well, it's going to matter. As I'm explaining why it matters, turn and keep your hand in Revelation 3 and turn and put your finger in Colossians 1 also. Again, why? Why are we turning to Colossians 1? We're trying to understand what John is saying when he talks about firstborn of the dead in Romans in Revelation 3. Well, let me tell you a couple of things that in increasing significance, so maybe you will mock or scoff at my connections early on, but hopefully over time they will be get more and more solid. Well, hey, did you know that Colossae and Laodicea were neighboring towns? It was like Peachtree City and Noonan or Fairburn and Union City. They were neighboring towns. Well, okay, all right, whatever. Uh, well, hey, did you know that in the letter to the Colossians, if you go to the end of it in 416, did you know that when Paul wrote his letter, he asked them not just to read it in Colossae, but to have the Laodiceans read it also. And similarly, he asked them in Colossae to read a letter that was coming from Laodicea. Oh, interesting, right? Listen to Dr. Thomas uh, as he you know, has a quote here that I have up on the screen about the connections now 
not just geographically, not just that they read each other's mail, uh, but about the content of, he calls it the two uh, uh, epistles of, I couldn't remember the valley, the two epistles of the Lycus Valley, which is Ephesians and Colossians, and how similar they are to the message to Laodicea in Revelation. Paul had commanded that the letter to Colossae be read in Laodicea. Quite possibly, the Laodicean church had copied Colossians and treasured it as they treasured other scripture. It could well be that John, who wrote after, in his use of the beginning of the creation of God, was appealing to their close familiarity with Colossians. There are similarities between the message to the Laodicean church and Paul's two epistles, Ephesians and Colossians. I'm not going to read each of those and the very similar te terminology in Colossians 1, where he calls Christ the firstborn of all creation, and 118, where he calls him the beginning, arche. Now, again, here's where I think the connection will be the strongest, this last thing. And that is, if you look in Colossians 1 and 118, and you read that, it says, who is Christ, the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead. Now, let me ask you, what grammatical technique did we learn about last week? You already know? Opposition. Opposition, right? What's in between What's in between beginning and firstborn of the dead there? A comma, nothing really, right? So what does that mean? Saying the same thing. It's, they're saying the same thing. It's my friend, Frank, took me to the airport. My friend and Frank are the same in that sentence. So whatever beginning means when referred to Jesus, it means the same as firstborn of the dead. And it seems John has that same connection because he talked about firstborn of the dead in Revelation 1, right? In the same passage that he was drawing from when he called Jesus the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So what does it mean for us in understanding what John means when he calls Christ the beginning of the creation of God? Well, we said earlier that our cone in Revelation 1 might mean that he is thinking of Jesus as the ruler of God's creation. But this connection to Colossians maybe argues the opposite, right? Because in this connection, he says he's the beginning, the firstborn of the dead. So in the firstborn from the dead, that's clearly a order thing. Of all the dead, right, Jesus was the first. We'll read some verses in just a second. All the firstborn from the dead, all those who were resurrected. We'll, we'll get to those in just a second. So that might argue that Jesus is the beginning. Regardless, again, um, the idea of preeminence is even there for the beginning. Sometimes the firstborn, sometimes the first is the ruler, right? And so even if we say the argument is that beginning is the right translation, it might have that aspect of preeminence or rule. It certainly does in Colossians, where he says he's come to have first place in everything because he was the beginning. But there's the big point. Here's the big point. In Colossians 1, verses 15 to 17, what we studied last week, what was he talking about, right? Was he talking, what was Paul talking about in Colossians 1, 15 to 17? How was he the firstborn? How, would he, how did he image God? How was he the firstborn of creation? Incarnation. Through his incarnation. He was talking about his entry in to this created world. He was talking about his entry into this material world that we see, right? That was the focus. And he was, how did he relate to it? How did Jesus relate to the material world? He became part of it. He became part of it. But how? But what was his relation to it? He's one of the guys, or uh, maybe you know, trees were higher than him. What was he? He's the preeminent. He's the preeminent, right? He's the highest of all creation. Of everything you see, Jesus is completely supreme. He's a part of it. He's completely supreme. And the reason he is is because he made it all. He made it all. That's why he's supreme. Now, what is the context of 18, verse 18 and down? He's no longer talking about the creation, this material world that he see, what's he talking about? First born from church. The, dead. the church. He's talking about the church. He's talking about God's new creation, as it were, that he's bringing forth. Right? Listen to these words, uh, these words of Scripture. Second Corinthians five seventeen. If any man is in Christ, he is a he's a new creature. God's made something new. Right? Remember, this is he even uses in Second Corinthians the terminology of. God shined into the darkness of our hearts and brought forth light. What did that terminology think? What did it remind us of when he says that? It reminds us of Genesis 1 when he said, let there be light. Well, he's saying in the gospel, God shines light and makes a new creation. 
Okay, so what about Galatians 6? Circumcision isn't anything, nor uncircumcision, but rather a, a new creation, right? Or Romans 6, 4, we've been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness, newness right? So Paul views the church, the body, what God has done in resurrecting Christ and us uniting with him and us being resurrected, he views that as a, a new creation, a new thing. A brand new thing that's different than this material world. And one day he's going to consummate it and bring a real new heavens and new earth to match it. And that's what the context is of 118. It's the church. It's this new thing that he's made. Right? In Colossians 118. Christ is saying, excuse me, Paul is saying Christ is preeminent among this material world you see because he made it all. And he's preeminent among the new thing he's making, the church, the new creation. He's ha- he was the first. Because how do you enter that new thing? It's through death. It's through death. You die and then you rise, right? And who was the first to do that? Christ. He was the first. So why is he preeminent in the new state of things? Why is he preeminent in the new creation? Because he's first. He's first. He was the first to go. Listen to these verses. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 23. Since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. But as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ, it is coming. Or listen to Hebrews 12. Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Author is the Hebrew, is the Greek word, get this, archagos. You hear the word ark in it? It means leader, pioneer, founder, originator. He's the one that started it, right? He's the one. He's the first. He's the one to go and pioneer it. So Jesus, when it comes to the church, is first. All right. He wasn't first in order when it came to this creation, right? He wasn't even created. He became a part of it through incarnation. He was first because he made it all. But when you think about the next one, when you think about the new creation that God's making, that you enter through resurrection, he was the first. And as a result of being the first, is the greatest. That's Paul's argument in Colossians 1. And that's very important for us in Revelation 3. Because I think, and I ask you, is it possible when John speaks of Christ as the arche of God's creation that he's not talking about, you know, this material world, these chairs. He's not, he's talking about the new creation. He's talking about what God has done in the church and that Christ is the beginning of that. And as the beginning the ruler of it. Now, I think the best evidence for that is what I've already given, the connection with Colossians 1.18, the similar terminology, the apposition between Arche and firstborn of the dead. I think a counter-argument would be that if John wanted to speak about not this, but the church, he would have needed to use the word new creation there, like Paul does often, a new creation. It doesn't matter circumcision or uncircumcision. What matters is a new creation. That's a good counter-argument. And as I mentioned, uh, I think my arguments get worse and worse every week. <laughs> but I still think it's the right thing. And I want to show you one final argument for why I think John didn't need to use the word new there, why John could speak of creation there. And in his mind, he's talking about the church. He's talking about what Christ has done. Let's go back to Revelation 1, right? Not an indirect connection to Revelation 3 like Colossians 1 was. A direct connection. Every letter looks back, every message to the churches looks back to Revelation 1. Revelation 1 5 is what Revelation 3 14 looks back to, right? We all see that. So Revelation 1 5 is direct context. And what is the context of Revelation 1 5? Right? This is the start of the book. And it says that John is writing to the churches. He's writing from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead the rulers of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. Right? So very gospel-oriented, very church-oriented, very new creation-oriented, the the redemption of sins by his blood. But here's the key one. Look look one more verse in verse 6. What did he do? In verse 6. He made us. What do you mean he made us? He made us to be something. He made us to be a kingdom. Are we Levites? Are we priests? Is that what he's talking about? 
Now, what did he do? Where did he make us a kingdom? Where did he make us to be priests? Through the church. Through the new creation. In the church, in the new creation, right? He made us. What does that word made make you think of? Creation, creation right? It's the Greek word poieo. You can hear our English word poem in it, right? It's the Greek word poieo. When it says in Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, what, what Greek word do you think is there? Poieo. Poieo. It's the same word. So John is thinking about a creation. He's thinking about a making. He's thinking about a creation. But he's not thinking about the trees and the fish and the birds and people. He's thinking about the making of a kingdom and priests. He's thinking about a new creation in the church. So I don't think John would have to use the word new in Revelation 3 to be speaking about the new creation. All right, I want to summarize and then talk about the next time we're together. We jumped around a good bit. It's not easy sledding. So here's the summary. When John calls Jesus the beginning of the creation of God, I believe he has in view the fact that Jesus, as the first one resurrected unto life as part of God's new creation, the church is not only he, he is of the church, not only the beginning, but also the ruler. He is the first and he is the ruler. He's the beginning, because that's what John and Paul have in mind when they think of firstborn from the dead. It's the first one. He's also the ruler, because John clearly links back to Revelation 1 and calls him the archon. But he's not a part, he's not talking about this material creation. He's talking about the new creation of the church. Of that, he is the head. And this verse has nothing to do with some ages past, first act of God in creating Christ. It has to do with Christ's resurrection and becoming the firstborn from the dead, the beginning of God's new creation. Now we will sing a song in just a second uh, that Annalise reminded us uh, existed. I, I forgot about it. It's a hard song to sing congregationally. We're not the best uh, music leaders, so it's going to be interesting. But it's from Andrew Peterson, and it, the two verses of it, the first are Colossians 1, 15 to 17, and the second is Colossians 1, 18 to 20. So it's a great verse. It was too hard uh, to us to choose at other times, but too good for us not to choose this time. But hopefully, as we think about uh, the, the last two weeks, hopefully I'm two for two in convincing you that these verses used by Arians are not talking about this ages ago first act of God. Uh, we argued Colossians 1 wasn't about a first creative act of God in the past, but rather about Jesus being a part of creation midway through history in the incarnation. And today, we've argued that Revelation 3 wasn't about a creative act of God way in the past where he first made Jesus, but about Jesus becoming a part of God's new creation. In fact, the beginning of it at his resurrection. So you could say we've avoided the idea of being Jesus created in the past before time, by seeing these difficult verses in the span of time, whether Jesus' incarnation or his resurrection. We won't be able to do that with Proverbs 8, which is the next one. If you look at Proverbs 8, you don't need to turn there, I've got it up here. It couldn't be any clearer that this is something that happened ages ago. This is not something that happened in the span of time. He couldn't be more explicit about this being before time began. And that may be why Proverbs 8, above all the other verses, was the one that was pointed to by Arius. Again, I mentioned we don't have Arius' writings. He lost. And as the losers of history often do, you don't, uh, you don't get to write history. And so we only have his writings through his opponents. But in the writings of his opponents, it's clear that Proverbs 8 was the linchpin of Arius' argument. And we see why. And it's the one that we'll look at next time, which we will continue, Lord willing, on July 10th. So let's pray, and then we'll sing that very difficult song together. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for making a new creation, for redeeming this one, for calling a people out of it, a people who are willing to go to you at the cross, to deny themselves, to die to self, to become a slave, to hand over all authority to you, as if we had a choice, but you call us to, and you give us that right to believe you, to trust you, to come to you, to take up our cross, to be called to you, to be united with you in death, all because you say that's the right way.
to live forever. That's the only way, is to make it through the judgment to come by being united with Christ, not just in his death, but also in his resurrection. By being united with him, we'll be able to participate also in his resurrection to life. And Father, that is uh, how we see Jesus, as the pioneer, the one who, who started that, who began that, who led the way, who brought a people with him of which, Father, we desire to be a part. And we've trusted and confessed our sins and repented to trust you to be a part of that. And we praise you, we praise Jesus, one with you who is in no way less, but one who, Father, is united with you in all ways and has accomplished this great redemption for us, for which we praise you and for which we thank you. And so, God, help us as we think of Jesus to never deny him, to never think lesser of him than we ought, to never take his glory, which is one with you, equality with you, the essence of you, and to diminish that for any reason, either base and carnal or even, Father, through a falling prey to, to dreams or speculation. Help us to understand your word. Help us to trust you in it and to worship you rightly. And thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.